So thank you, Anna, for the introduction. Uh, as you mentioned, uh, I'm uh, at Consensus, and uh, Consensus is a company developing uh, uh, systems for the uh, Ethereum 2 network. Uh, so in this talk, I'm going to talk about the formal verification of uh, Beacon Chain, and I will uh, introduce what the Beacon Chain is and what we did to verify it. So um, it's a uh, the conference is about testing and more broadly about uh, verification. So I hope uh, it's okay to talk about verification, formal verification and the testing. So this work is a joint work with uh, my colleague at Consensus, Joan Fuller, and uh, a colleague at uh, the Ethereum Foundation, uh, Aditya Asgaonka. So I'm uh, at Consensus in the Trustworthy Smart Contracts team, and I'm based in Sydney in Australia. Right. So. What is the beacon chain? So you may have heard about the uh, Ethereum uh, network and uh, the way it works at the moment is uh, uh, the Ethereum network is basically maintaining a, a distributed ledger and uh, the way it maintains a distributed ledger is uh, in a decentralized and distributed manner. So decentralized means that uh, there's no sort of uh, central point of control. And the way it works as, at the moment is that you've got uh, different agents in the network and they all have to agree uh, to build uh, the sequence of uh, transactions or entries that are going into the ledger. So at the moment, the, 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 the Ethereum 1.0 network is working with what's called the proof of work uh, uh, distributed uh, consensus algorithm. The next uh, generation of Ethereum, Ethereum 2.0, will be running with uh, uh, a different uh, system, which is a proof of stake. And uh, so that's the, the bottom of this diagram. Uh, this is the Ethereum mainnet, Ethereum 1, and the bottom is the Ethereum 2. And in Ethereum 2, there will be a, a special, uh, let's say, specific chain called the beacon chain that will be somehow the uh, orchestrator of the whole network. And in this, uh, in this network, there are uh, participants, and the participants uh, are, can be validators, and the validators are in charge of maintaining um, the distributed and decentralized ledger. So in this uh, new version of the uh, Ethereum uh, platform, the beacon chain plays a central role, which is uh, orchestrating how the actually data are stored and so on. And also it plays a central role in deciding at each uh, round, and uh, each level, I would say, in the blockchain. So you add blocks one by one, so there will be at different uh, levels and height in the, in the chain. You, you try to add blocks to the ledger and the block sh blocks are recording uh, transactions that are happening in the system. So you can think about like maintaining bank accounts. Every transaction is a credit or withdrawal and you update the state of the system and you add the transactions in successive blocks. So um, there's a special chain in this uh, Ethereum uh, 2.0 system, which is the beacon chain. So it maintains the, the set of validators that are participants in the network. And uh, because it's a proof of stake um, consensus algorithm, the validators have to stake some assets in the form of uh, ether. And this is the role of this beacon chain to maintain the set of, uh, let's say, the balances of uh, uh, the validators, uh, each uh, to also make sure that uh, the different validators uh, can take turn in participating in the network. So it's not always the same validator that's going to propose what, what, go, what goes into the next block. So what transactions are selected to get in, uh, it has to rotate and be fair and so on. So this beacon chain has a special status, I would say, in the, uh, in the whole uh, Ethereum 2.0 network, in the sense that it's, uh, it's really the core of uh, Ethereum 2.0 uh, orchestration. So the specification of this chain uh, are in the form of a state machine. So in this talk, I'm not actually going to talk about uh, distributed systems, which is uh, in, in, a, in a network like Ethereum, are the nodes and the participants uh, get to agree on which transaction is going to be processed next. So that's, that's uh, taken care of by a consensus algorithm. But the beacon chain specifies what the, the state change is. So if you're in a given state, you've recorded a sequence of transactions in the form of blocks, and you get new transactions coming. Um, what, what is actually the, the state change that is triggered by the uh, addition of new transactions? So from, from a given history of blocks, a new block 
arrives and they are new states to be computed and that's what the beacon chain specification uh, specified. So each participant in the network has to implement this uh, state machine that describes how the beacon chain should be working. And that's what I'm going to talk about today. It's about how to verify that this state machine behaves as intended. So if there are any questions, uh, please, uh, you can ask them now and interrupt me. Feel free to do so. So I'm not going to talk again about shards and other uh, different layers like smart, smart contracts and so on. I'm going to talk about uh, the state machine and verifying that the state machine that implements the beacon chain is correct. So why is it important to, to do so? Um, and, and what kind of formal verification uh, and what kind of results are we expecting? So the first thing is that this uh, beacon chain uh, maintains a, a record of uh, the stakes of the validators and they are staking Ether, which is a cryptocurrency. And if you've got lots of validators and the price of Ether, uh, like it is at the moment, is high, uh, they are, the beacon chain is actually recording transactions that, that corresponds to a huge amount of assets. Uh, the second thing is that it's not obvious that the, the functioning of this state machine is correct in the sense that the specs uh, may be uh, ambiguous and, and buggy, so that's not specific to the beacon chain, that's uh, something that can happen for any, any system. And uh, it's quite a big system, the beacon chain, so it's hard for developers to have a, a sort of a big picture and a whole, an overview of what's happening in the system. It's hard to understand. So the thing is that you can see the system as a, uh, being buggy uh, can, can have uh, serious consequences in, in terms of, uh, uh, let's say, uh, being taken offline or losing assets in the form of ether that you can never recover or things like that. So that's really important to verify that uh, this can never happen. Uh, another difficulty in, in the work we are uh, doing, uh, we've been doing, actually it's, it's finished now, it was uh, finished a few months ago, is that the, the specifications are the, uh, as they were standing before, uh, they were given in the form of a Python-like language, which was not uh, executable. So it's uh, the syntax of Python, but it's never been uh, executed before. And there's no uh, clear functional specifications of the system. Uh, so you can see overall this beacon chain as a mission, mission critical uh, system once it's, it's deployed. So it's, it's very uh, critical in the sense that any bug in it could compromise the entire network. And uh, it's similar to an embedded system because once you've deployed it, if you want to make changes to it, so you, you have to ask all the participants in the system to update their state machine. So there could be, uh, you know, uh, uh, absence of synchronization, uh, different nodes not running the same uh, system and so on. So that could be uh, very hard to, uh, to patch and, and, to, and to fix. So there's a real incentive to try and make sure that the, the code is, uh, is, is bug-free. So there are, there are uh, of course, um, uh, techniques that have been uh, uh, used to, to try and read out the code uh, and, and, and find some bugs. So the, the beacon chain has been uh, implemented or the state transition machine of the beacon chain has been implemented in different languages, uh, executable languages. And for these languages, you can use a standard testing approach with uh, lots of uh, interesting uh, findings that you can get, finding bugs and so on. But again, uh, as uh, it was mentioned by Dastra, Dastra in the 70s, uh, testing can find bugs, but it cannot um, uh, provide and, and guarantee the absence of bugs. So in our work, we want to complement the testing techniques and use formal verification to provide a thorough analysis of this system. So what we, were, we, we agreed with the Ethereum Foundation, what we agreed to do is to report uh, the, the problems we found and the proposed issues. So our work was basically to try and prove that the system was correct. And when we discovered that there was something that could go wrong, we not only determined what could go wrong, but we proposed some fixes and proved that the fixes were actually correct. So they were actually fixing something without breaking something else that could have been uh, 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 broken once you repair a bug, right? When you fix a bug, you may actually introduce another one. So uh, in our work, we use formal verification techniques, so this cannot happen. And what we delivered is a, a, Git, a GitHub repository. Uh, I, I will provide a link later on with the formal specifications of the beacon chain, 
with a correctness and termination proof. So correctness means it's a, it's a mathematical proof with the help of a proof assistant uh, that the code does what it is intended to do. And termination is that every loops in the programs uh, in the beacon chain terminate. So eventually they will provide a result. And uh, we also in our work provided uh, examples of implementations uh, for the, the functions of the beacon chain. So in the next couple of slides, I'm going to uh, give you a reminder of the techniques we can use to, uh, to provide guarantees that the code is correct and uh, to introduce the, the tool and technique we've been using in this work. And later on, I will provide some examples of actual properties that we've been proving on the beacon chain. Right? So, yeah, first of all, I will summarize what the project scope was. So, um, we set off to design a formal specification of the beacon chain. So, from the Python-like uh, uh, specifications that were given by the Ethereum Foundation, uh, we wanted to write a formal and mathematical specification of what the code uh, is supposed to be doing. And on this specification, we wanted to provide some guarantees that um, the code was doing uh, what it was supposed to be doing. And among the guarantees, we want to make sure that there's no runtime errors. So for instance, uh, there's no arithmetic overflows when we compute on, um, let's say, integers or uh, other numbers. Uh, there's no uh, array out of bounds uh, errors that can be triggered. So you've got an array and you want to show that every time you request uh, an index in a given array, this index is actually uh, exists in the array. You're not uh, below zero, let's say, or above the length of the array. So that's the kind of proofs that we want to, to, to guarantee. Uh, we prove that all loops again terminate. And we provided also functional guarantees. So I'll show some examples later on. And on top of that, so that's what we want to prove. And what we want to do as well is to develop what's called a machine checkable proof that the code is correct. So. Um, you could provide, uh, let's say, a pen and paper uh, proof that this is happening, that the code uh, guarantees some properties. But this is error prone, of course. So what we want to do is to develop a machine checkable proof. So you write your proofs um, as uh, programs. And there's a machine that can mechanically check your proof. So that's what we've been doing. So what is the technique that we've used to uh, formally verify the beacon chain? So we used um, all logic, uh, a system of uh, uh, a verification system uh, using all triples and uh, all Floyd logic. And for the tool, we used the Daphne uh, verification friendly language. So just a reminder of uh, what it looks like, uh, this uh, sort of uh, Floyd all logic system and how we applied it. So uh, the, the, uh, the all logic uh, system of proof, so that's, for, uh, that's not for proving termination, that's for proving what's called uh, partial correctness, is based on using a splitting, separating, a clear separation of the specification, what the code is supposed to be doing, or what properties should the result of a computation satisfy, and how the result is computed, which is the implementation. So I give you a simple example of a, a function. It's written using the Daphne syntax, but it's very similar to a, a standard programming languages. So this function is supposed to be computing, um, let's say, the, uh, the next power of two of a given number. So for instance, uh, if this number is three, the next power of two is four, and so on. So what we want to do is, uh, first thing is, um, you see that the, the typing system is uh, that the, the integer you, you, you pass to this function can be an integer, so it can be negative. And we want to roll out uh, computing this function for negative numbers. So we add a precondition to this function in the specification. So it's part of the specification. And this means that this function can only be called or uh, yeah, can only be called with a, a positive integer. And this is given by what's called a precondition. So in, in Daphne, it's written using um, a keyword which is requires. You can have as many preconditions as you want. And when you've got many, uh, they act as a conjunction of all the preconditions that you list. So this is what we, what we want to see. And then 
what we want to see when the function computes, so the, the body of the function is here, so it's a recursive computation. Um, so when we start in a given state where the precondition is satisfied, so when we, we, co we call the function with the positive integer, we specify what we would like the result to satisfy. So in this case, I say, okay, the result, if you start with the positive integer, the result computed by the function should be larger than one. So what it means is that if we start the computation and the precondition is correct, if the body of the function uh, terminates, then we would like the result to satisfy, we should have the result satisfying this postcondition. So you may notice that it, it doesn't require anything if, if the body of the function doesn't terminate. So for proving termination, we have to use a different device compared to a pre and post condition. But that's basically what it says. It's a contract between the function and uh, the client that are going to call the function. If you call the function and the parameters verify the precondition, then you guarantee that if the function terminates, it will satisfy the post condition give, given by the ensures. So there's a few things as well that we can see on, on, this, uh, on this simple function is that uh, in the post condition, I haven't actually specified exactly what the function is computed. As I, I've specified something which is an abstraction of what the function is computing, saying, well, it should be larger than one. So it's not the exact definition of what the next power of two is, right? So you don't need to provide the exact strongest post condition of what a, a function does. You can use um, any abstraction that you like. So this... Uh, uh, logical reasoning system and, and, and the way of uh, specifying, uh, uh, separating, I would say, specification and implementation was defined by uh, Orr and Floyd. And now uh, the question arises, if you've got a function and a specification and the body of a function, how can you prove that the body of the function, when it starts within a state satisfying, I mean, the, the input parameters satisfying the precondition, you run the function, you want to prove that on all of the possible computation paths, when the function terminates, the post condition, which is a predicate, is true. So how, how can you do that? And the way to do it is to use all Floyd logic. They provide syntactic and semantic rules to reason about programs with specifications. And if you want to prove that the program is correct with respect to a specification, you have to use the rules of the logic and, and build a proof that demonstrates that starting uh, in a, in a set of states that satisfy the precondition, you end up in, in a set of states satisfying the postcondition for all the parts of the function. So I would say um, until uh, the early 2000, um, it was a, quite an endeavor to try to use uh, uh, all and flood logic. You had to, to prove programs by hand and so on. So it was uh, error prone. The rules are not, uh, uh, well, they are. Uh, precisely defined, uh, but uh, with the pen and paper you can uh, make mistakes. The thing is that now there are uh, proof assistants and engines that can uh, somehow um, uh, implement the reasoning rules that you can use in all logic. And uh, one of these uh, tools is uh, a verification friendly language called Daphne. So in Daphne, uh, you write your program. So that's what I wrote before, the function, let's say, or many functions calling other functions. It doesn't really matter. And you equip them with pre and post conditions. And the Daphne verification engine, so it, it, it's a compiler, if you wish. The Daphne verification engine computes a logical condition called the verification condition. And this verification condition has a, a nice property, which is it's going to be uh, valid which, which means always true, if and only if your program, when it's executed, satisfy, satisfies its pre and post conditions. So what Daphne does is it computes this verification condition from your program, and it, it then sends it to a, what's called a SAT solver or an SMT solver, which can determine whether this condition is valid or not. So if this condition is valid, your program is correct. Uh, if uh, this... Uh, uh, condition is uh, not valid, uh, it can usually provide a counterexample why uh, the property doesn't hold. So that would mean that uh, there's a, a sort of a test where you start the program in a, in a state with the value satisfying the precondition, you run it, and the result doesn't satisfy the postcondition. 
so it's it's quite uh, quite useful. And there's a third uh, possible outcome, which is uh, it's inconclusive. So basically, uh, you use some resources. The Daphne verification engine runs for quite a while, and it can't find uh, the answer. So this part is actually something that uh, is inherent to uh, formal verification for programs that are uh, moderately complicated. So uh, you may know that. Uh, if you start with programs that can uh, have two uh, integer variables and do some simple computations, uh, two counter machines, uh, simple properties of two counter machines are uh, not decidable. So this is why uh, in, in this uh, overall technique, you may end up with uh, the system uh, enabled to define the result. And in this case, you have to uh, try and help the system uh, to, uh, to actually uh, find the proof. So the way you help the system to find the proof is that in Daphne is that you can have, you can add proof steps. So how to prove that the pre and post conditions hold, you can add proof steps in your, in your programs. And the proof steps are themselves written as programs. So the way you use the, the language is you start with the program with pre and post conditions. You ask uh, the Daphne verification engine to verify it. If you're lucky, it's verified. If there is a counterexample, you have to fix either your specification or your program, and you iterate again. And if there is a timeout, you try to figure out what's missing in the proof and add some proof steps in the program and run it again. So that's an iterative process. Any questions at that point? So if there are no questions, I'll continue. So now, um, how did we apply, um, sorry, clicked up the wrong slide. How did we apply this scheme to the big chain? So first I'm going to show um, the different components of, of the beacon chain. So the, the main one and the central one is what's called the state transition uh, component. This is the one I was mentioning at the beginning. It defines how to uh, compute uh, the new state of the chain, where the chain is in a given state, there's a block, uh, a new block of transactions uh, happening, and uh, it defines uh, what the next block is. So it's a state transition function. So that's the, the main, uh, I would say, uh, bulk of, uh, of the work is the state transition function. It's a state machine, and we have to prove that this state machine uh, does what it's supposed to be doing. In, included in Beacon Chain, there are actually other components. So there's one that's called the uh, SSZ and Merkleization. So this is basically a component which is a library that's used to encode the data structures used in the Beacon Chain to serialize them and deserialize them. So we've proved that component as well, but this is not a part of it. It's, it's not a state transition, it's a standard uh, library serializing and deserializing data structures, but we've proved it too. And there's a third component that we have uh, started to, uh, to verify, but it's not in the verification of this component. We have uh, provided it, but it's not integrated fully with the state transition. It's uh, what's called the fork choice, which is uh, proving that every node in the chain is going to build a canonical chain. So it's based on some properties and on the protocol and, and an algorithm that's defined in the paper. So we've proved some properties of this uh, of this uh, fork choice uh, protocol and uh, partially integrated them in the proof of the state transition. So notice that this actually, uh, the proof of the fork choice was not initially in our contract with the Ethereum Foundation. We, had, we didn't have to do that, but we tried to, uh, to do more than uh, we, we proposed and to extend it to uh, uh, more high level properties. So all these results and explanations and the code of the specification is available uh, in this uh, repository. So in the next uh, few slides, uh, I'm going to, uh, to show you some examples of, uh, of code that we have written in the verification language Daphne. And uh, to illustrate uh, how we have proved uh, these uh, three components, so uh, parts of these uh, libraries, the state transition function, uh, the fork choice and uh, after these uh, three examples i'll demonstrate um, a bug uh, that we have found in the system that's a non-trivial bug and was not found before uh, by testing so that's something that i will uh, i will show you how to uh, uh, well i will illustrate uh, the, the stock with uh, how we discovered this bug so let's start with the uh, the SZ and Merkleization. So, as I said before, this component is a separate one compared to the state transition, and it's um, 
it's a specification that describes uh, given an object of a given type in the in the beacon chain uh, standard types they have their own uh, types there are tuples lists and so on so you serialize them into sequences of bytes and you want to be able to deserialize them back so this is basically when nodes have to communicate over the network uh, they're going to serialize uh, data structures in sequence of bytes, and then you send them to another participant, and the other participant can deserialize them if they know the type uh, to retrieve uh, the information that was sent. So I, 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 I've got an example here, for instance, in the beacon chain, the, there are data structures that are a list of bits, and lists of bits are encoded into lists of bytes, which are eight bits wide. And uh, the serialization process, for instance, you take this list, list of bits, you're going to copy it and then add enough bytes to, uh, to span over the length of this list. And uh, to serialize it, so to make it a sequence of bytes, you add a Sentinel, sort of a, a Sentinel-1 at the end of the list. So this encoding would be, you've got the initial list, and to serialize it, you add a 1 at the end, and then you pad with zeros, uh, and you get... Uh, Two bytes. So this list would be encoded as this uh, two bytes and sent over the network. So when you deserialize it, of course, this bit list, you do the reverse operation. So you start from the, the right hand side, you remove, you, you, you look for the first one, and then you know that this is the sentinel, so it's not part of the list, and then you take the previous part to deserialize. So there are other data structures in the beacon chain, uh, tuples, um, uh, integers, uh, uh, what do they have, uh, vectors, and so on. So this kind of uh, serialization and deserialization uh, operations are defined for each of the types. And of course, you can compose these types as well. So the property that we'd like to see in this system is that you, when you send, you serialize a data structure, you send it over the network, and uh, at, the end, uh, at the other end, uh, another component is going to deserialize it. It should be the case that they retrieve uh, the actual uh, uh, a source component. So a property that you want to prove is that if you take an object O of a given type, you serialize it, and then you deserialize this object that was serialized, uh, you would like to find exactly the same object. So that's called an involution or identity property, if you wish. So that's something that was uh, the main property to prove about this component of beacon chain, uh, the uh, SSZ and Merkleization library. So this is... Um, uh, what it looks like um, in, in Daphne. So in Daphne, as I said before, you, you, you saw some example before of a function with the pre and post condition. So in Daphne, you can write uh, special functions that are called lemmas. So lemmas are just uh, standard functions, but they, they don't need to be executable. And this lemma is a proof of involution. So it says uh, you, you take a a data structure, which is, uh, in this case, it's not a container, not a list, and not a vector. So we prove this property uh, for different types, but th this uh, lemma is for a subset of the types. And uh, you, the proof goal is that uh, the two functions, so there are two functions, serialize and deserialize, serialize and deserialize, and we prove that the composition of these functions uh, produces always the same value in the form of... So from S, you find S, and it never fails. This is the the sort of the meaning of this uh, success uh, uh, data structure. So this is uh, uh, the shape that uh, this can take in, in the verification uh, language Daphne. So when you use Daphne, you fit Daphne with this program, and Daphne is going to automatically check whether this lemma holds using maybe other sublemmas. So this actually function call is a, a call to another lemma, and it's going to compose everything and with its reasoning engine try to prove that uh, the post condition for this lemma. Uh, uh, it is satisfied. So it's again a fully automated process. You, you, you try to ask Daphne whether this, is, uh, this program is correct. And if it's correct, you're happy. If it's not, you'll have to provide some uh, proof steps uh, in, 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 the, in the proof of value. So as you can see here, I've provided some proof steps. For instance, I've said, depending on the type of, uh, of objects that you have, it's serializable, and serializable is uh, a type that can be uh, subtyped into different type, bit list, bit vector, and so on. So for certain types, I say if you want to build the proof that, uh, that this property holds for S being a bit list, uh, then I provided the proof for this bit list in this lemma. So you can apply this lemma, and you compose the applications of lemmas, and you find the proof uh, for the, 
this type bit list, and then you can enumerate the different subtypes and build a proof for each of them. And so Daphne is going to check uh, that this uh, composition and these subproofs they are organized in a correct manner, they are all true, and then we can deduct that the uh, conclusion is true. So this is uh, this was the first component we started with, which was the simplest one in the in the specifications. It's a serialization deserialization component, so that was not. Uh, uh, too hard, I would say, to start with. So I'm now going to give an example of um, the state transition function. So this is the one, again, that takes care of uh, adding blocks. When there's a new block arriving on a given state of a chain, it has to compute the next uh, state of the chain. And um, so basically, there are a few things happening So uh, uh, in the beacon chain. So a state change occurs every time a new block uh, is taken into account, arrives. So the order in which the blocks arrive is taken care of and decided by a consensus algorithm. So we, we again, we assume that this is uh, decided and the given node that we are uh, trying to prove uh, the correctness of receives the block and we're going to prove that the state transition is computed according to the specification. So in the beacon chain, um, the time is divided into slots and the uh, slots uh, are grouped into what's called epochs. So if I remember well, an epoch is uh, 32 slots. Um, and uh, what's happening and, and why it's not trivial to prove properties of, uh, of the beacon chain and the state change is that uh, when the block arrives within an epoch, you've got some uh, updates. Uh, and when the block arrives at the border of an epoch, so you change epoch, for instance, uh, there are more complicated updates that are computed to update the state. So they are more complicated because they basically, at each epoch boundary, uh, they build a summary of what's been happening before. So you somehow, uh, in the state change happening at an epoch boundary, you're going to take a snapshot of the previous epochs. And that's uh, building this snapshot is uh, non-trivial. So I'm going to illustrate this uh, with an example and tell you what we did as well. So our proof strategy was, uh, we started with the, the imperative implementation of uh, the Python specification somehow, or Python-like specification of a beacon chain. And from there, we tried to synthesize a functional implement, a functional uh, uh, definition of what the code should be doing. So if you wish, this uh, Python-like specification will tell you how to compute the next state and uh, we use this as a reference to try and compute a mathematical definition, a functional definition of what the next step is. And we did that for all of the functions in the beacon chain, which is, uh, there's quite a few, there's quite a few dozens of functions. And our strategy was once we had synthesized these functional correctness properties, we tried to prove that the Python-like code, so I illustrated here a sort of a function state transition with the the, the call graph of this function state transition. So once we had uh, uh, synthesized the uh, functional correctness uh, property, we tried to prove that the Python-like code satisfied this functional correctness property. So the outcome of this process uh, was that we had a reference functional specification, so which is uh, interesting in, in a few um, for a few reasons. The first one is. Because it's the functional correctness uh, requirements, we can compose them quite easily because it's a function composition. So we can, we can uh, basically very easily say what's happening when you compose uh, over a few steps uh, uh, the state change. Uh, it's also um, uh, good if you want to open up, uh, let's say, uh, uh, the, 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 let's say the participants to write their client code into a language that's not Python-like, that's not imperative. So if you want people to be able to, to write their uh, client uh, using uh, functional languages, it's good to have a functional uh, reference. And it clarifies quite a lot of things. So among them, I would say uh, the most interesting one is that in, in the imperative implementation, you've got the, how the, the state change is computed. And this code is, um, is actually um, quite tricky. There are lots of uh, assertions in the code, so assert statements. And uh, so they can be nested, for instance, if you see this call graph, you call state transition and state transition would call process slots and so on. And in all of them, there are assert statements and the specification, uh, the imperative implementation actually of the beacon chain says that if one of the assert statement fails somewhere, then the state transition function should revert to the previous state it was in. So somehow you abort the computation. 
the problem in, in, in this kind of work is that uh, you, you, you start state transition with uh, some parameters, and then if it fails somewhere, uh, you don't get a reason why it has failed. Was it because you provided some uh, ill-defined parameter or because of uh, a mistake in the implementation and so on? So providing uh, a functional correctness uh, a reference specification is uh, very helpful in the sense that it enabled us to say, with, in, if this property is satisfied, then the state transition function should not fail. So that's something we contributed to. And on these uh, functions, the, the, the outcome, the results we contributed were that we proved for all of them uh, the absence of runtime errors like overflows, underflows, division by zero, array out of bounds, and so on. That every, uh, every function that would contain loops, uh, uh, we could prove termination of the loops. And again, we could prove properties beyond uh, runtime errors, functional correctness properties that the functions were computing things according to what they, they had to compute. So an example, for instance, is uh, uh, when you compute the chain, the beacon chain, um, it, it's actually represented uh, because there can be many asynchronous actions. It's a tree, but you would like to prove that there's actually only one um, uh, one way to go back from each node to the ancestors of a node. And when you go uh, as much as you can back in, in time, you end up in what's called the genesis block. So that's a property that we proved on, on this uh, on the Python-like implementation. So I'm going to take an example of the state transition function and the, one of the functions that's called in it to show you how it's encoded in, in Daphne again. So that's, uh, that, that, that's quite a lot of, uh, I would say, um, uh, uh, conditions and post-conditions. So just to illustrate what I was saying before, uh, we have, um, for instance, synthesized this uh, condition which tells us when a block is valid. And when the block is valid and can be added to a given state, this function state transition should not fail. So that's what we want to prove. So compared to the previous implementation, uh, this is a real progress. The other thing that you can see is in this uh, post condition. This post condition, we have to ensure that the next state that's computed is equal to our uh, functional uh, definition of uh, the computation. So these three functions, update block, forward state to slot, and next slot, they are uh, functional definitions, reference definition of what the, uh, the evolution of the state is. And we prove that the computation in the imperative code that I haven't showed here, but uh, this code is imperative, there are loops and so on, computes exactly the same thing as this functional specification. And also other properties, we can add as many properties as we want. So this is uh, uh, quite tricky. And of course, if you have a, a method like state transition, and I mentioned before, uh, that, uh, sorry, I would like to go to the previous slide. Yeah. So state transition uh, calls a process block. Uh, to prove properties of state transition, you'll have to prove properties of process block. So that's what we've done as well. We prove properties for each of the functions. And again, uh, we've used uh, uh, predicates to specify when things should not go wrong. So this is another example here. If we have a valid beacon block body, which is a part of a beacon block, then we want to specify that the code should compute something that ensures the, the post condition. So in this case, the computation should not fail. There should, shouldn't be any assert statements in the code that, that, should, that would fail. So that's the, the computation of the, of the state transition function. Um, so one, I'm checking the time. So one last thing we did on, on the side as well is to prove that uh, the fork choice uh, protocol is, um, is, uh, is correct. So I'm going to skip this part because I, I see that I'm uh, at 40 minutes already and that's not essential. And the result is in the repository. You can, uh, you can uh, have a look at it. I'm going to focus on one uh, interesting point we discovered. It's uh, in the uh, GitHub repository for the, the, the Python uh, reference uh, specification of a beacon chain. It's uh, the issue number uh, 2500, and there's a possible array out of bounds. And I'd like to convince you that um, formal verification was, uh, I'll try to convince you that this was very uh, useful to find this problem. So this is in one of the, of the functions of uh, peak and chain. So this is the example of the code uh, written in the Python-like uh, uh, implementation in, in the, in the peak and chain uh, definitions. So there's a function called process rewards and penalties. It calls a few different functions and it ends up calling uh, get attesting indices. So no matter what these functions are doing, that's the, that's the sort of the call graph of this. Uh, 
and um, it turns out of so I can't see right, right so um, get that testing indices so the the, the last uh, function that's called in, in in the chain yeah the last function that's called in the chain uh, is illustrated here and in this function there's a sort of a filtering happening so this uh, this line says uh, you take all the indices in this um, list committee you, you take all the, the indices in committee you arrange over them and you select the ones you take an index and you select the ones for which uh, uh, a bit in, uh, 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 an array an element in an array bit is true so we're going to filter uh, this set of indices in the enumerate committee and take only the one for which the corresponding index in bits is true. So if you want to prove that this function is correct, you have to prove that there's a sort of a properties uh, between the length of this uh, committee and uh, the length of the bits array. Otherwise, if this index can go outside of the bounds of the bits array, you've got an array out of bounds error, a runtime error. So this involves actually uh, showing that um, because we, we have some constraints in the definition, the, the length of bits is given, that's given by this uh, constant, uh, it's uh, max validators per committee. So this amounts to proving that every time we call this function that computes committee, we call get beacon committee, we have to prove that get beacon committee returns an array uh, or a list with a length less than the maximum validators per committee. So during the course of this proof that my colleague uh, Joan uh, worked on for quite a few weeks, um, she discovered a few interesting things. So she discovered that it's not always the case that they can actually be an array out of bound zero. So she discovered that for uh, another parameter in another function, if this parameter is less than 4 million or something, then there's no array out of bounds. She could also prove that if this parameter, which is the number of what's called the, the active validators in the system, is between two different values, uh, then there's at least one other input. So you see that there are a few inputs to these functions. So there's, uh, there's one input vector, if you wish, that will that we create an array out of bounds. And if this value is larger, so there are lots of active validators, then it doesn't matter uh, of, of the input. Uh, there will be an array out of bounds all the time. So this bug was uh, far from trivial, and it took quite a few uh, weeks to actually uh, narrow it down. Uh, and, and then provide a fix uh, as a, in the form of a precondition uh, to make sure that this is not happening. So the detailed issue has been reported in, a, in an extensive bug report. We've reported uh, quite a few issues on the uh, uh, Ethereum specification uh, GitHub repository. So if you're interested, you can have a look at the uh, Ethereum uh, specs repo. So what are the limitations, assumptions, and simplifications that we, we've made in this work. So there's uh, a few things we've done. So for instance, uh, um, concerning limitations or abstractions, I would say, uh, there's lots of uh, crypto functions in the code, so like hash functions. And in our code, we haven't uh, had to assume any, uh, any specific hash functions. The only thing we had to assume was that we assumed actually that there was no collision. So we haven't proved any probabilistic properties about the code. We assume no collision and probe the, the rest of the properties. Um, we haven't actually, um, let's say, used the actual uh, types that are used in the SSZ libraries in the state transition proof. We have used the Daphne types to simplify. And we have not taken into account randomness as well. So in the code, there are some, uh, uh, some randomization uh, that we haven't actually modeled. The simplifications we have made uh, are pretty, uh, I think, uh, uh, reasonable. Um, so I I in some of the proofs, we have used the Daphne data types rather than the actual uh, data types that are used in, in the beacon chain. We have also assumed that uh, there are stakes for validators and it's one ether instead of 32 ether. It does make a big difference um, because everything is a linear combination in the formulas of, uh, of this uh, standard value, so that should still work. And um, uh, we have also provided some, uh, some bounds and some proofs about the fixed amount of ether and uh, the maximum number of validators that can be in the system and so on to, uh, to prove that some properties are correct. And of course, there's a big assumption in our work, uh, which is uh, we use a, a verification-friendly language, Daphne. So Daphne itself uh, has a verifier computing this, uh, 
let's say, a verification condition, plus uh, it outsources the, the satisfiability check of this condition to a solver Z3. So we have assumed that this is sound. So we don't need it to be fully correct, but we assume that the Daphne plus Z3 is sound. That means that if we, if, 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 uh, if it declares that the program is correct, then the, the program is correct. Uh, it could declare that the program is incorrect and, and it's actually correct. That's uh, incompleteness, but we've assumed soundness to make sure that uh, there's no bugs that can uh, uh, escape us. And uh, for some of the, uh, the proofs that we have done, we have translated the Python code, Python-like code into Daphne-like code. So we assume that the semantics of the two languages are similar enough. It's a sort of a shallow embedding of the code of Python in Daphne. Uh, so we assume that the semantics is preserved. And finally, um, a few uh, a few numbers. So in terms of um, uh, verification effort, uh, this was equivalent to 24 uh, person month. So there was uh, uh, one person, uh, I was actually the expert in formal verification and my colleague Joan was uh, new to formal verification, but she, 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 was, she had an advanced level quite quickly. So I wouldn't say it's, it's a problem. Um, we have also worked together with the Ethereum Foundation. So we had uh, our colleague Aditya from the Ethereum Foundation helping us to navigate the original Python-like specification. Um, we also organized a few um, focused uh, reading groups to read papers on uh, the different parts of uh, uh, the, the, the beacon chain. And uh, at the end of, uh, of the project, we organized as well Daphne coding training sessions for uh, the Ethereum Foundation. A specification writer to try and help them to read our code. And overall, uh, this project we think is in the, in terms of the size, is in the top five projects written, ever written in Daphne. Uh, so they are not, not too many, but uh, it's probably the, in the top five. So in terms of uh, contribution as well, um, we fixed a few bugs and issues, but uh, our, I would say, work uh, contribution is a bit beyond uh, this uh, concrete bug fixes and, and, and discovery. Uh, it triggered some discussions on how to write uh, specifications and so on. So it was uh, uh, quite a, a, a good and fruitful discussion with the uh, software, I would say, uh, original beacon chain specification writers and us to try and, and find a middle ground into writing uh, specifications that can be understood by developers as reference specifications and specifications that are actually formal, and we can reason about them. So the code itself, um, um, we have used the language Daphne. Uh, we estimate that we have verified the 85 to 90% of the functions in the beacon chain. We haven't modeled all of them. There's a few that we haven't taken into account. We provided more uh, than 20 uh, bug reports and fixes. Uh, we provided also bug reports for the Daphne language too. Um, We've proved uh, around 250 theorems. So some theorems are hard to prove, some of us are easy to prove. So it's not the number that should be, uh, I should not show off with the number. Uh, some of them are easy, some of them are hard. Um, we've actually um, done something which is uh, quite useful as well. I think it's, uh, there's the lines of code of the specification, formal uh, function specification, and the Python-like implementation in Daphne. But we've added uh, almost uh, 5,000 lines of documentation to uh, a doc to document the code that we have written. And that was a joint effort between uh, the Ethereum Foundation and the consensus. So I'm almost to the conclusion. We think the impact uh, is, uh, we've been uh, uh, congratulated by our colleagues for the impact we had in the sort of a trust that we can uh, put in the beacon chain. So we've got the formally verified uh, kernel of uh, the SSZ Merkel uh, uh, fork choice and the beacon chains. The proofs are machine checkable, so you can run it yourself. In our GitHub repository, we have a Docker container uh, that runs Daphne and can check the proofs. The specifications that we have, uh, as I said before, are language agnostic somehow. They are functional specifications. Of course, they are written in Daphne, but there's nothing specific to, uh, to Daphne. It's uh, mathematical functions. And uh, it could be a candidate if uh, if people would like to refine it a bit more to be the reference specification for the beacon chain. And it contains the, the documentation as well for all the, the, the data structures and the functions, what they are doing and so on. Uh, 
I think during the course of this project, we've also tried to, uh, to foster the use of formal methods in, uh, in this ecosystem. And we wrote uh, blogs to explain what we were doing. Uh, we gave talks and wrote papers and so on. And we even tried to evangelize the people at the Ethereum Foundation by giving them some, uh, uh, some uh, uh, training uh, on using Daphne. So uh, overall, uh, we improved the, the specifications of the, of the beacon chain, but there's still some work that could be done. Uh, there are things that we haven't fully implemented. So this would, uh, this would require actually quite a lot of hours to be spent. That, that's quite tedious, but we think uh, it's not going to help find uh, any other bugs. So that's why we haven't uh, pushed the boundary and tried to implement these, uh, these uh, leftovers. Um, in terms of uh, uh, resources, I would say, so just to, uh, to show you some reflection, the resources to write the original Python-like specification, there were eight average uh, specification writers. Or the verification, which is a task that you should think is, uh, is harder, there were two people, uh, Joan and, and myself. So we managed to prove quite a lot of things, uh, uh, I think, uh, considering the restricted number of people. So that's one. Uh, one conclusion I would take actually for these kind of projects, um, if you have a, specific, a team writing the code of eight people, software developers, I would say, and you want to verify it, uh, you should probably try to match the number of people to, to do it. Otherwise, uh, uh, the effort is, uh, is limited. We'd, we've done what, what we could, but uh, with more people, we could probably have done a bit more. So the main, um, I would say, difficulties we encountered during this project were that the, the, the original Python-like specs were uh, not structured. So they were even sometimes, uh, they, they would not type check because they've never been uh, written uh, in, in, uh, in an executable language. Um, the fact that the sort of uh, the correctness of the code is implicitly defined by uh, exceptions, so that's uh, very hard to understand. The fact that data structures, for instance, are sometimes almost duplicated, so there are variations of them, but uh, they could be uh, probably bundled into one uh, one data type uh, it is not uh, easy to reason about. Um, when we use the language Daphne, there's uh, some uh, sometimes limited support uh, in the IDE. So you have to, uh, uh, it's a new language or, well, not so new, but uh, with limited support, it's not as well supported as Java or Python and so on. Um, there's some sort of instability as well in the Daphne proof engine. So sometimes you, you don't understand why a proof that would uh, verify before doesn't verify uh, in a given time now. It's not because it's not true anymore, but because of uh, the changes into uh, uh, the internal uh, verification engines. So it doesn't change the, the result of the, the outcome of the, the verification engine, but it changed the time. And this instability can be quite, uh, quite tricky to, to manage. So overall, I would say um, the lesson we learned as well is, um, I think it's not only us, but uh, it's very hard to verify code that has not been written for verification in mind and that's what we endeavored to do and uh, that was a difficult process so uh, we would advocate for using uh, let's say verification at an early stage in the project if you want to use it uh, effectively because the uh, the later you use it uh, the harder it, it, it becomes to, uh, to 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 be fruitful and, and productive and effective so there's a summary of um, uh, the resources and the code and the paper that we have recently written, summarizing our uh, experience with this, uh, with this project. And uh, I'll be very happy if you have any questions to, to answer them. And I thank you very much for your attention and for inviting me to talk about this project.